Is everybody ready? Is everybody looking at me? Everybody's looking at me? <clears throat> Let us not waste our time in idle discourse. Let us do something while we have the chance. It is not every day that we are needed, not indeed that we personally are needed. Others would meet the case equally well, if not better. To all mankind they are addressed, those cries for help still ringing in our ears. But at this place, at this moment, all of mankind is us, whether we like it or not. Let us make the most of it before it is too late. Let us represent worthily for once the foul brood to which a cruel fate consigned us. What do you say? It is true that when with folded arms we weigh the pros and cons, we are no less a credit to our species. The tiger bounds to the help of his congeners without the least reflection, or else slinks away into the depths of the thickets. But that is not the question. What are we doing here? That is the question. And we are blessed in this, that we happen to know the answer. Yes, in this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Godot to come. Hi, this is Nathan. Hey, this is Nick. And this is David. Welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. On this episode, we are reading Beckett's Waiting for Godot, a tragic comedy in two acts that was written just after the Second World War that is more or less about nothing but how we fill our time waiting for something. I think. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, that's one thing we could discusses whether or not it is about waiting. And I think the description that Beckett gives it a tragic comedy is certainly a good place to start. Do you fellas think it is more tragic or more comic? Or do you think it blends the two together well? I think uh, for me personally, so before I read the, the play, I watched a performance. And the performance I found to be more tragic with comedic elements and kind of anxious and a little depressing. But then I read it and I thought it was quite funny with, you know, points of poignant philosophy, but predominantly humorous. Yeah. I so it's hard for me to answer that without thinking of the rest of Beckett's stuff because if I think of this with respect to kind of the rest of his works, it really ranks high on the comedy side. I mean, there's parts of this that are just sort of like laugh out loud sort of shenanigans, just a lot of crazy repetition and just stuff that you can see is totally written for an audience. And so I just want to say, yeah, of course, this is this is meant to be a comedy, right? And obviously, then they're joking about hanging themselves and weighing the merits of the rope that they're using and who's heavier. So then you're like, well, that's obviously a little bit of a dark topic. But I think I think what's cool about this is that there's a lot of different variation in Beckett's tone over his career. And I like this because it rides that line of being so funny that it's accessible, but there's enough stuff going on underneath that it completely has a nice foundation of everything philosophical, all that good stuff. And so I, I just view it as a really useful, inclusive trick to the audience. Like the comedy is a vessel for yeah, like I'm gonna thoughts trick about... you into having a good time yeah. before you realize you're actually <laughs> thinking about death. <laughs> Or before you realize that this is how you waste your own life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your own waiting for Godot is actually watching the play waiting for Godot while you're waiting for something else to happen that never happens. Yeah, and that how you spend your days is nothing better than switching out bowler hats with your buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I think I, I think I would watch a play that was people just watching this play. Waiting for Waiting for Godot. And that may already exist because everything exists on the internet in the world. But I'm just putting that out there. If somebody wants to patent that, I, I would I would be an audience member. That'd be a hard pass for me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess the the waiting. Let's let's go with the title, right? So there's a huge element of time here, and it's split up into two acts. And my question to you guys is, how much time, if any, passes in this whole thing? Do you mean do we believe? Are we like in the perspective of Vladimir where we think just a day has passed? Yeah, or... Is it a day? Is it a purgatory? Is this a fantastical thing? Well, I, I don't, I mean, I think there's lots of clues that this isn't the real, where this isn't supposed to take place in any sort of real world. So I, I can't help but, but read, 
you know, not just the passing of time, but time, but the characters themselves is uh, allegorical. So time, time is passing and they refer to it as a day or Pazzo had been traveling for six hours. He also looks at his clock or at his pocket watch and then and says it's, it's been stopped. 60 years and another time it's stopped. So it's time as a abstract concept, but I, I don't think that it's, you know, infinity has passed. Yeah, but they're they're also as characters, they're kind of obsessed with it in a way. And then there's also this middle ground thing of you know how many leaves are on the tree, right? So some have come back, and it certainly seems like two more for only one day to have passed. But it is trying to establish a thing. I think it just comes back down to the fact that one of the things I really love about Beckett is that that reality that he's not trying to put it into this totally surreal, like way out in left field thing. He's messing with it enough to sort of transcend it and to make it a topic, but not to push it so far into a fantasy or so far into realism that it's committed to one side. It's really about the experience within time, but time doesn't really matter. But it is still just this curious thing when you get back to the, you know, the old title of this of, is this really just a topic of us waiting for something, whatever that may be? I think that's kind of where it is. It's not, and it's not that time doesn't matter. It's that time is is fairly relative to each of the individual characters, and they do share a sense of time, especially the the two main Didi and Gogo. Right? They talk about how much time they've spent together, fifty odd years, doing this or doing that. But each of them sort of have a different sense of how much time has passed, which is part of the humor why they can't remember what they did yesterday where they were yesterday, what seems familiar, what doesn't seem familiar. And I think that's part of the, the joy of, of the, the play in a sort of greater scheme, which is that people have very individual reactions to things. Yeah, and there's this nice little exchange that I, I think sums up a lot of that. And so Didi says, that passed the time. And Gogo says, it would have passed in any case. And then he replies, yes, but not so rapidly. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, God damn, that's the whole thing. Well, certainly, I mean, a lot of the action if you could call it that in the play is they're attempting to pass the time more rapidly and they they try to trick themselves into passing the time more rapidly but because they're aware that they're tricking themselves they never can fully engage in whatever it is that they're trying to do whether they're switching the hats around or exercising or fighting or whatever everything everything is simply motivated to pass the time nothing is motivated in itself Except perhaps when, uh, in the second act, when Pazzo and Lucky, the slaver and slave, fall down and they go to help them. That that, that almost seems to like to break their waiting. Yeah, because it's like quite literally the only thing that happens. I mean, I guess outside of them arriving and stuff, right? Yeah. But yeah, it is it is sort of the climax, if you will, of a thing occurring. Yeah, that's actually a great point. Maybe that's that's what he's getting at is however much you're in your head about this concept of, of waiting and time, the only, the only thing that can possibly change it is external. It's hard to make definitive statements about what Beckett meant because, I mean, it's, it's so sparse, but also everything that he says he also, or everything that's in the play also seems to be you know, a joke about the thing in the play. So the jokes kind of carry it along, but because the jokes never stop, it's not clear what what is actually being said, other than I suppose that they are in fact waiting. But um, Vladimir, one of the two uh, protagonists, and maybe the main protagonist, he seems to be the one who does most of the thinking. When he observes Pazzo and Lucky in this, when they've collapsed and can't get up, he says, "We are no longer alone, waiting for the night, waiting for Godot, waiting for waiting." All evening we have struggled, unassisted. Now it is over. It is already tomorrow. And then Pazzo says, help. That seems to suggest to me that, that the only way out of this waiting in perpetuity for, you know, for death or for insight or inspiration or salvation or what have you is to help those around you. And that that is the escape. Or that that is Godot. Do you find actually some sort of moral in all of this? Oh man, I, I it's it is a total moral morality <laughs> play. Wait, you don't? I mean, I I I was thinking this as like a nothing play, right? 
Nothing I, is more real than nothing. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I kind of bounce back and forth because I see it as it's like I, I, I see it as like quite sin- a sincere morality play underneath a veneer of uh, absurdity and mockery. Interesting. I don't think I've ever perceived Beckett as a potential moralist. More so somebody picking apart the the contradictions and the absurdity of it. There's there's something something that, that maybe influences the way that I think about this play is something that occurred in Beckett's life, which was in when World War II started, he was living in Paris. And um, he wasn't an especially political person. And he was from Ireland, which was neutral, so he could have returned to Ireland. But rather than doing that, he stayed in Paris and joined the resistance. And he, he didn't fight, but assisted in the resistance movement against the Nazis and was very close to getting arrested by the SS and fled at the last minute and waited out the war in southern France. And thinking about what that must have been like, you know, he was working as an agricultural laborer, just waiting for the war to end. He had no control over it. He was far from home. And he had put himself in that situation because he had done something, you know, presumably that he felt was morally right, even though it put him in this very compromised situation. And I can't help but think that, you know, that that, that kind of decision would under... That was before... And he was already a writer, but that was before any of his major works had been published. And this was written, you know, not long after the war. I don't know how much his experience during the war influences, but I can see this play being a morality tale and somewhat optimistic, surprisingly, as a sort of post-war sort of post-war positive thinking message, I guess. (laughs) I I can't find a better word for it. But that's... It's about perseverance. Yeah. I can see that. And I certainly, and maybe it's because you want to look for something there, but it's I can certainly see that as part of the play, especially how the play ends, where Estragon says, you say we have to come back tomorrow? Vladimir says, yes. Then we can bring a good bit of rope. This is, of course, to hang themselves. <laughs> Vladimir, <laughs> Vladimir says, yes. And uh, there's a slight pause estrogen Didi, yes i can't go on like this that's what you think and then just a short few minutes later after after gogo drops his trousers and he's standing there they 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 just stand they wait they don't they don't move on they just kind of wait for the day to pass the night to pass you know it's going to repeat itself and somehow that is not as depressing as you think it might be yeah, so I, I've been chuckling the whole time on this side because the the transition from like post-war optimism piece, the uh, the quote you pulled to to argue for it was the one in which they talk about hanging themselves. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think, think that's that's true. That's that's that's. I mean, if you want to compare this and think about this in relationship to other sort of existential post-war writers, you know, Camus' whole thing about you know what you can do in the face of absurdity the first thing you have to decide is whether or not you're going to kill yourself. After that, there's other options, right? Yeah, and there's kind of a, there's a natural um, flow to some of the literary movements with respect to the major wars. And there's uh, sort of the concept of being critical and when it comes into fashion. And immediately after the war, there's actually a lot of optimism, which is then inherently followed by a period of pessimism because people get sick of whatever they have. The war is being so destructive that there is a need for, even in the intellectual community, some sort of positivity, right? And then, actually, you know, I think that maps relatively well to Beckett, too, as he got older and the things that, you know, he started writing after this became, in my opinion, a more more exploratory, darker, more retrospective, stuff like that. So I, I, I can feel it. Um, I don't think I got that from this reading whatsoever. Um, especially because if you just put this next to some of his other major plays, Endgame and Crap's Last Tape, like this just feels like the poppiest thing. But it always felt to me like a just a clever move that he was doing to trick you into cool jokes <laughs> about suicide. I see. I I think this fits really well, especially at the same time he he wrote his his famous novel trilogy, which has a lot of similar themes. I mean. There's this idea of of going on, which comes from 
I think it's probably Beckett's most famous quote, which comes from the unnameable. I'm sure mm-hmm. you guys know this one. The last sentence. Well, the last line well, of the last sentence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So it's perhaps it's done already. Perhaps they have said me already. Perhaps they have carried me to the threshold of my story before the door that opens on my story. That would surprise me if it opens. It will be I. It will be the silence where I am. I don't know. I'll never know. In the silence, you don't know. You must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. And that that refrain of go on appears throughout the trilogy and throughout this play. You have Didi and Gogo themselves saying it just earlier. Gogo says, I tell you, I wasn't doing anything when he was asking him about what he did yesterday. And uh, Didi says, perhaps you weren't, but it's the way of doing it that counts, the way of doing it. You want to go on living. And there's this, this I, I think Nathan's right. I think there is this sort of, I don't know if it's a necessarily moral message, but it's certainly, I guess it could be moral. It's somewhat optimistic if you're okay with facing the void by just doing whatever you can to fill the time. There's one other point that I want to bring up about the play that, you know, it's not, it, we have these two characters who are just waiting, but if they were just waiting and it was just them, to, there's nothing to compare them to, then I think it would be more open to interpretation. But I can't help but compare them. And I think it seems to me that because of the sparseness of the play, Beckett intends you to compare these two characters who are waiting for Godot with the two characters who are not. And that's Pazzo and Lucky, the slave and slaver who pass by. And they're you know, with the exception of a boy who's the messenger of Godot, they're the only other characters in the play. And they have, they experience a very different fate than Vladimir and Estragon. I mean, I think partly it's because, maybe partly because of my temperament, but also partly because of the stripped down nature of the play that everything seems to be symbolically significant. So these two characters come by, contemplate staying and waiting for Godot, but decide to to move on. And they're participating in this very other game, this game of power and struggle and advancement and materialism. And they continue on. And this is the end of the first scene. In the second scene, they return. And when they return, um, they're not, uh, Pazzo isn't as boisterous as he was. Now he's blind. Um, and Lucky can no longer uh, spew the academic nonsense that he was spewing before because he's mute thankfully <laughs> and then they collapse and they can't get up and the only people who can help them get get up are uh, you know are two homeless poets and that that to me I, I can't help but read that as very as being a very moral message that like in spite of everything in spite that they don't have anything they don't have any material possessions they don't have they hardly have any hope they don't know what they're waiting for but they've persevered in this waiting on something that, I mean, I, I read it as some, as a divine. They're waiting for God to, to reveal himself. And because even though they don't receive any message, just that waiting itself keeps their eyes open, keeps their brains working, and maintains their ability to, to communicate and help those around them. And because night's coming for all of us, we're all going to die. They're going to die. Pots is going to die. Lucky's going to die. And you can, you can maintain your awareness of that, or you can participate in this illusion. And that will, the participating in the illusion will eventually be worse than the waiting. Yeah. And you kind of, so you hit on a thing that I think is another important thing to discuss, which is Beckett's relationship with religion and sort of where he comes from with respect to that. And so Beckett, you know, grew up in Ireland and kind of, middle class, upper middle class, Dublin, um, very uh, apolitical to start, sort of in a classic like suburban scenario. Um, parents, not necessarily artistic, um, but he kind of went through that path and was always a little bit detached from that, but had the same fervor of religion without religion. I think you can read a lot of his works through that lens and it starts to fit, is that there is that entity that is so strong and passionate but it isn't necessarily traditionally religious. But I think another thing that comes into play here is one of the things that he identified a lot with was the concept of quietism, which is 
within the sort of Christian sense, it's it's basically the idea of you know accepting like a greater God, right? Um, but if you take it in sort of the Beckett sort of secular religious sense, it sort of is just acceptance. And if you if you merge that or rather contrast that with you know some of the other stuff in the in the twentieth century, your your classic existentialism and all that, and a lot of that was trying to strip away things such that you could rise above it. But I read from Beckett, especially with the I can't go on, I'll go on, is that acceptance that this is going to happen anyway, and I'm going to get on board because fighting it is not necessarily a productive or useful thing, and I'm just going to roll with it. And then I think I'm I'm still like hung up on the is this a positivity type of thing, because I read it not necessarily as apathy, but basically the intelligence of acceptance and, and understanding what that does, because with the exception of, you know, kind of the French resistance stuff that you mentioned, he was notoriously just like really outside a lot of this stuff. He was not, he was not active members of these movements. He was sort of disconnected, a little neurotic, always off in his own head, somewhat moody. And so he was exploring a lot of this stuff, like what's his relationship as an individual to the whole. And, you know, possibly there's a poetic overlap there where, you know, at some point, you know, you can't go on, you'll continue to go on. And so you have to participate. But that's like what it comes down to. And so I think there's a lot of that that shows up in here, especially with, you know, sort of those end quotes about just continuing to move forward and time's going to pass without us. We might as well just roll with it. And so that's kind of that's the mood I get is not this resounding like, fuck, yeah, like optimism, but more (laughs) so like, well, what honestly, what's the point if you're not going to roll with it? It's going to move without you. Like, just just quietly accept it. But I think, you know, considering when this was written in the post-war and in France, which was, you know, destroyed. Um, and the, the, you know, the psychological upheaval that that caused and the, the, that Europe as a whole was kind of losing its faith in God. People really didn't know what to do. Like it's, it, I think it's easier for us to say like, yeah, just roll with it. But at the time, uh, maybe that was more of a resounding message. Like there was a time, you know, decades earlier that, that you could pray and that you believe that that God was listening to you because, you know, things were pretty good. Things were pretty okay. Even when things were bad, they were pretty okay. And now you're living in a country, in a continent that's just destroyed and God couldn't possibly be listening. Um, and I think, you know, regardless of what, what God is, you know, I don't, I don't think that Beckett is making any claim about any religious claims specifically, but at the same time, have faith like you have to you have to have faith you have to continue on because that's all that's all we do and i you know you back to the question of like confronting with this absurdity do you commit suicide do you continue or not that's that's the question and so in that in that regard i think it is a positive message like you do continue and you laugh and help each other and sometimes you exit the stage to use the bathroom. <laughs> as long as your seat's saved. <laughs> <laughs> he would have he would have burst. <laughs> I kinda wanna jump back to the difference between Didi and Gogo and Pazzo and Lucky, because I think if there is this positive message, it might be in the difference between those two, which Nathan you say that setup is there for a reason. But we didn't really talk about why, so thinking now about the difference and what makes them different other than Didi and Gogo accept to wait but also that Didi and Gogo have a bit of a they're like a they're like a buddy comedy show like they they have interaction they have companionship where the other two do not they have a clear power dynamic between the two and I, I don't know if that's where you're going with why they are punished maybe quote unquote punished but what do you see as being the meaning between seeing these differences? Um, the way that I read it is that, um, how do I phrase this? Beckett walks such a magnificently fine line of like not saying too much that to say anything about it seems to be saying too much. But it seems to me that our two heroes, uh, you know, our buddy duo, that they are, for whatever reason, following this moral imperative to wait for Godot. There's no reason that they're waiting for him. They don't know the reason they're waiting for him. They don't know if he's going to come, but they feel morally obliged to wait. Pazzo and Lucky don't feel that moral obligation. They're looking out for themselves. 
you know, Pazzo wants to abuse and use and benefit from. Lucky, Lucky wants to somehow, you know, rise in the esteem of Pazzo. Um, that they're not involved in anything outside of their particular situation. They're not involved in anything supernatural. And I think Godot is is supernatural. He's he doesn't belong to this world that the play takes place in. Um, I mean, he even has a white beard. I think I think Beckett like is hitting the nail on the head. Honestly, I mean, he's joking about it. It's a joke. But Godot has a white beard at the end. Godot doesn't do anything. I mean, his name's Godot, G-O-D. Even <laughs> Pazzo's like, are you waiting for Godot, Godin, Godet? But he repeats, God, like there's various names for God. Oh, you're waiting for God. That's nice. Um, maybe I'll wait for a little bit. It'd be nice to know God. Actually, I've got to get on to sell this slave um, because he's no good to me anymore. But, you know, if you're going to wait for God, then, you know, more power to you. Like, it's great that you're waiting for God. So I, I really see it as that. It's like even even in the absence, even as religion's crumbling, even as society's crumbling, keep your perspective, keeping your perspective on the uh, the supernatural order of things, not on on immediate gains, not on your particular situation, um, allows you to go on, allows you to see like when people need help, allows you to see who your friends are, um, allows you to be friends, and. Pazzo and Lucky don't have that perspective, and so they they are reduced to a simple power dynamic, which, um, for reasons unexplained, uh, you know, in a, in the a, a, the passing of one day, come back blind and mute. So, I mean that that's that's the way I see it. I'd be what what are your thoughts? I just keep thinking about just the interaction with religion in general, and sort of yeah, the concept of, of like you said, sort of accepting the supernatural world world order i believe uh was the phrase um and sort of having some level of interaction and acceptance with that but then also just mixed with uh skepticism of religion to start with right and there's actually a really good quip that i I laughed out loud at um but there's this part where vladdy uh or sorry uh gogo who doesn't like his boots is trying to go barefoot Didi goes but you can't go barefoot he goes christ did he goes christ what has Christ got to do with it? You're not comparing yourself to Christ. He goes, all my life I've compared myself to him. <laughs> but where he lived, it was warm and it was dry. I said, yes, and they crucified quick. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 do, I do completely agree that he's, he's trying to walk that line. And if you mix it with his relationship with religion, but then he's also taking a dig on that side too. And so I think he's... You know, in a lot of a lot of classic Beckett stuff, he's he's straddling a lot of stuff at once, and he's he's trying to figure out what that balance is. He's not like as you mentioned, like trying to put too many words to it. It's difficult because he already wasn't putting very many words to it, and so he never at once is trying to push some sort of philosophy. But I think it's more of an acknowledgement that there is a philosophy, and that's for you to figure out. I wonder, you know, Beckett, um, and. The two of you can speak more to this, I'm sure. But at, over the course of his writing career, pared down his writing more and more and more to get to what it was that he was essentially trying to say without saying things that didn't need to be said or confusing the matter. Um, is that is that fair? To get to quite literally how it is. Yeah. Which, if you're familiar with that book, it's just this <laughs> choppy, very like, I don't know, almost like, proto prose like before it exists it's just this i don't know these boulders almost of a man crawling through the mud yeah but Be- beckett more and more got i think obsessed with figuring out what the subjective eye was like that everything gets reduced to this idea of okay i am this being that thinks what outside of my thoughts exists if anything what outside of this you know corporeal experience is that real and just became very obsessed with the eye and the self in relation to the world or in relation to itself yeah which is why placing this along the trajectory is of his works is, is kind of tricky right because you see the end point i feel like this doesn't fit as well with the end point uh, yeah but it certainly fits pretty well with some of the earlier murphy and uh, Mercier and Camir. I mean, that's another buddy comedy. 
But can't I mean? Isn't it? Aren't the seeds of that already placed? I mean, this maybe compared oh, to Slater the, work isn't as sparse, but it's pretty sparse. Yeah, I mean, it's it's turning the knob, right? But like when you get to when you crank that knob even further, when he gets into it's not only is it um, you know more difficult to comprehend and stretches you as a reader. It um, it's exactly kind of what David said. It's like it's trying to push that concept. And I, I feel like when you push that concept, it actually even takes it out of things that we can classify. It's more like truly metaphysical, like it, like what yeah. is this thing really? And that's honestly it's one of my favorite parts about getting into Beckett is like you really lose the words to sort of categorize it. You know, is he talking about existentialism or is he talking about this ism? It's really it's just like no, it's, it's actually the the experience at some level of you being inside yourself and what does like that even mean what did you mean what does the self mean and all that and it just gets so stripped down and so abstract that it like i, don't know, I think it's unparalleled i don't i can't think of anyone yeah. else who's who's done that no because outside of this and endgame everything that sort of follows it's really much it's really it's really just almost entirely a person a narrator there's not a lot of interaction Mm-hmm. which is wh- wh- why I was thinking maybe it has something to do with the relationship because, or this is, was just maybe a transition period because Beckett really doesn't do a whole lot of relationship material ways people interact with each other. Well, there's, um, regarding the relationship between Vladimir and Estragon, Estragon is mostly comedic relief, right? I mean, he doesn't, re- Vladimir says all the interesting things and Estragon misunderstands him and that leads to comedy. Yeah. Um, there is an idea that they are actually, if you want to, there's a lot of interpretations that they are really two parts of one person. Ah, uh, the dualism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which that, I mean, you could totally see that. I also feel like that's, I mean, that's like the classic, like, of course, Beckett was talking about dualism the whole time. Yeah, two aspects of a self or how we interact with ourselves. Right. Having conversations within our own head to, like, who are you talking to when you have a conversation with yourself in your head? Yeah, that's fair. Um, we've kind of moved around away from the classic is this of substance, but sometimes it's still fine. Yeah, but, I mean, I think based on our conversation, you can assume the answer is yes, but I mean, a play that has been in production nonstop for nearly 70 years, you can't not call it of substance or can't we i i can't and if you can then you're full of shit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well i wonder like like i feel this way about a lot of existentialist stuff to be honest it's like it was really interesting to me when i was 21 when i was 18 to 21 mm. but a lot of times i read it and it's just like this is so navel gazing like get out and do something like ultimately sitting in your room like examining your own head doesn't get you very far because that's not the biological creature you are and you're not in control of your fate so learn what your fate is and then live it out that's that's your responsibility and then you have on top of that the post-war like so you had a whole society that was basically experiencing the upheaval of being 17 and we don't we don't have that society right now you know and so to me, it, it this work and works like this feel like they make much more sense understanding the context from which they come. But um, I guess I, I, I want to ask, do they have value now? Does it have value now, right now, to you? Yeah, see, so I still listen to all the same records when I was 18 to 21. So these books are <laughs> still hitting it. Uh, so just not going to change forever um but i I think actually one of the reasons why this is not my most favorite beckett is because it happened before he got into that later period where i think he got outside of and removed these call them attachments to isms if you will to sort of popular philosophies and, and whatnot and i don't think he was ever directly a vessel for that but you could see that he's churning on these things and so i think one of the reasons why the the trilogy, even if he doesn't like to uh, refer to it as that, um, why that's so important is because... What was the name of the trilogy real quick? It's uh, Malloy, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable. Mm-hmm. 
so those just they really try to deconstruct and get outside of all of that by getting totally inside one person's consciousness right and so i think that has the most power of any of this um but something like waiting for godot and why it continually resonates is that it is a path towards that and to me it's not as like just total we'll we'll use navel gazing even though i i like this shit um but you know like uh sartre's nausea or something right um that book is great i love it um but that one is really kind of preaching a certain type of thing and i think this doesn't fit as well into that category it's almost exiting that and if you follow him to where he's leading i think it's super powerful yeah i'm more with nick on this one i and i don't i don't necessarily see this as excessive na- navel gazing i really don't and i think nathan's idea of you know just go out and do something then you can't help but not but you kind of are living like pozzo a little bit because you're getting away from from i guess waiting but uh, now i'm now I'm, I'm going in circles with my own logic here <laughs> in my head that's what happens <laughs> yeah. that means you successfully interpret it because you're replicating yeah. it well, yeah, because I, and that's the thing, I go back and forth, and that, I think that's why I like this play, even though I agree it's not the best Beckett, I really still love it, because there's so much fun to have just thinking about and interpreting it, and I go back and forth. At moments, I'm like, this is dull and repetitive, and this is a bigger waste of time than what these two are doing, but <laughs> then then I'm like right there with them, like, you know what, that's really what life is, we just got to got to have a little fun we wait for fill in the blank god art purpose meaning what have you to to come which it never will not really but i i guess that's that's my point i mean i feel like that's the to me the feeling that a word is going to come a message is going to come that's going to alleviate this existential burden of going on is a very adolescent way of looking at the world. Like you are an animal. You are here to eat and fuck and travel and work and sleep. You're here to do those things and that's it. And is that the it's order the, in which you do those yourself? I uh, I do them simultaneously. <laughs> the It's going to be a mess. So it's not it's not <laughs> <laughs> more the better. It's not waiting. It's accepting. And once you accept, then you're not waiting anymore. You're moving. I don't, you're, you're, but I don't think that's true. I think Vladimir. I think there's this idea that, especially in Vladimir, there's an acceptance of waiting, of knowing that you are going to wait again and again and again. I think that's what the play is. I think there. That's what it is. I think it is acceptance. I mean, I I agree. He's accepting that he's waiting, but I think that he's he exists in this world that Beckett created, and I think that there's a flaw in that world, which is that there is nowhere to go, and you go to the grave perhaps the most poignant way to wrap this whole thing up is this exchange between Pazzo and Estragon where Pazzo says I don't seem to be able to depart Estragon says such is life I don't think I want to hang out with Beckett. He sounds like a drag. <laughs> got drunk and got into an argument with maybe his pimp, and then they stabbed him. Yeah. Oh, Wait, yeah. That got real. That was his pimp? Well. What do you mean his pimp? <laughs> <laughs> a, a his, pimp pu- his publisher? A pimp that he was familiar with from his okay. prior engagements. Yes. You are right. The, the way that sentence rolled out, it does appear to be hinting at a different style of thing. He, he yeah. had to make money somehow. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Starving artist. How are you going to pass the time, you know, waiting for the war to end? Renters were getting real expensive on that left bank. <laughs> well, if that's not a good way to end, I don't know what is. <laughs> Let us not waste our time in idle discourse.